Jesus said to the Jews I am the living bread which has come down from heaven anyone who eats this bread will live forever and the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world then the Jews started arguing with one another how can this man give us his flesh to eat they said and Jesus replied I tell you most solemnly if you do not eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood you will not have life in you anyone who does eat my flesh and drink my blood has eternal life and I shall raise him up on the last day for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink he who eats my flesh and drink my blood lives in me and I live in him as I who I am sent by the living father myself draw life from the father so whoever eats me will draw life from me says the Lord this is the bread come down from heaven not like the bread our ancestors ate and they are dead but anyone who eats this bread will live forever the gospel of the Lord question number one from the readings of today hoping that you have listened to the readings of today what can we say is the link between the word of God and the bread of life if you listen to the readings of today the three of them what can we say is the link between the word of God and the bread of life question two identify the various levels of meaning or connotations of the expression body of Christ body of Christ just meaning on various levels question three what are the implications of sharing in the body and the blood of Christ what are the implications a for our relationship with God and B for our relationship with our fellow Christians question four there is a widespread belief and dietitians and people who are telling us to eat properly are saying and many of us have come to believe that we are what we eat we are what we eat you eat junk your body is junk you eat good food vegetables bitter herbs no sweet then your body is it's in good shape like those vegetables and fruits we are what we eat now how does this apply with regard to the Eucharist how does this apply I will attempt question two the body of Christ on one level refers to the church where Christ Jesus is the head and we are the members and as members with Christ Jesus we form one body he is the trunk or he is the tree and we are the branches so together we form one body okay on another level it is a divine body which bread is changed into his body that we are given to take as nourishment for our souls and to give us the strength and the grace to prepare us for our heavenly kingdom number two uh, is that all we are waiting okay another person will have her give her a round of applause our attempt question number four yes if truly we are what we eat as they said 
a Christian who has received Christ is not supposed to be nothing less than Christ. He is supposed, he or she is supposed to be a mother. He or she is supposed to be a constructor and not a destroyer. When I say a constructor, I mean he or she is supposed to be a hope, a model to the society also because Christ is a model. So if you eat him, you are supposed to be like Christ. That is why we are Christian. So if you have the opportunity to receive the Eucharist, because it's not all. So if you have... What about if you use yourself? Do I say you? Okay, if I uh -huh. receive Christ, I am not supposed to do nothing less. I'm not supposed to destroy. When I say destroy, I am not supposed to go out there dancing some kind of music which I'm not supposed to. Because Christ is in me. Christ dance good the music. The person where they dance, they enjoy now. You mean as I dance here, they destroy? Because I am what I eat. What am so I destroying here? It depends on what you are dancing. Oh, uh, they dance for the Lord here. Fine. So you are what you, you eat. So Christ is in you. And so you dance according to Christ. You don't dance according to the word. Oh, there is a dance according to the word. Of course, Father. Oh, okay. Give her a round of applause. Yes. See, there's a dance according to the world. Glory to Jesus. Honor to Mary. Our ten question number one. He said, What can we say is the link between the word of God and the bread of life? Simply eternal life. Because the word of God gives eternal life, and the bread of life itself also gives eternal life. Glory to Jesus. Eh, 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 not yet. <laughs> Yes, glory to Jesus, but not yet. What is the link? We are saying, yes, the word of God gives eternal life. The bread of life gives eternal life. But what is the link between them? Jesus says, um, Jesus says that he who hears the word of God and keeps it will have eternal life. And who will receive the body and blood of Christ, which is the bread of life that comes down from heaven, also has eternal life. He get he correct, but he remains small. Give him half a plus, half. Yes. Glory to Jesus. Um, I want to attempt question number one. Good. The word of God and the bread of life. Yes. Both are spiritual food uh, for the soul. Okay. So when we live on the word of God and this same bread of life, which is Jesus Christ. The word of God is Jesus Christ himself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the bread of life is Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ himself. Give him a round of applause. <laughs> so, when we eat the bread of life and we take the word of God in us, we are taking spiritual food. The spiritual food is the link between uh, the two. Glory to Jesus. He won't spoil them again. He won't spoil them again. Yes, madam, here. Yeah. Uh, who can help us complete it? Help the two of them complete it. Yeah, I think the word of God is Christ. And he is also the bread of life. So yes. the link between the bread of life and the word of God is that it's the same thing, the same Jesus it's the Christ. the same Jesus Christ. Hey, hey, give her a round of applause. <laughs> Yes, there's a hand there. Uh, in the book of John, <laughs> John chapter 10, John chapter 1. Yes. Yes. Was God. Yes. 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 And that word is Jesus Christ. Uh -huh. And now in the book of uh, what we read today in the gospel. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. So, in that word is Jesus Christ and also that bread. You see where the link that I'm looking for? Uh, you are correct, but you see, in that book of John you have quoted, yeah. verse 14, it says, and the word became flesh. flesh. And Jesus Christ says, I am the bread of life. I give you my flesh to eat. That word that became flesh has become the bread of life. That is the link. Clamp for me and uh, Mike. Thank you. I want to answer question number two. Oh, 
what is wrong? Okay, yes. Body of Christ. Body of Christ is just the Holy Eucharist. What we take and is like an, an agreement with God. But when we take it, I feel the it, we are asking for the levels. You have said Eucharist. That's one level. Do you know another level? He tried. After all, Helen answered only two, and she has, he has answered one. By the time he gets to Helen's age, he will answer four. Give him a round of applause. Glory to Jesus. Glory to Mary. I want to attempt question number three. Yes. What are the implications of sharing in the body and blood of Christ? A. For relationship with God. B. For our relationship with fellow Christians. When we share in the body and blood of Christ, it nourishes our soul and reduces our relationship with God in forgiveness of sin. Okay. For relationship with the fellow Christians, as is read in the scripture, when we share one bread, it brings us together in one body and as a family of okay. Christians. Okay. Thank you. Give me a round of applause. Yes, Angela. I to answer question four. When we receive the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist, we have become Christ. And Christ is us. And therefore, we have to exhibit those qualities of the one we have become. We have to be merciful, generous, loving, kind, forgiving, compassionate, and all that. Because those, those are the qualities of the one we have received. Thank you. Give her a round of applause. And to complete the other ladies, give uh, Mrs. Mwachuku, to complete what you said, we are not just to be like Christ. I say, they say we are what we eat, not we are like what we eat. Did I say we are like what we eat? We are what we eat. How does that apply to the Eucharist? Like you said, we become Christ. Jesus Christ says, I am the light of the world. And haven't shown us his light. He sent us out. Did he say, go and be like the light of the world? He says, go and be light of the world. So we are not just like Christ. We are to be Christ to our neighbor, to the people that we come across. Thank you. Father, in addition to question number three, the implication of sharing the body and blood of Christ is that we love God. And we also, love, we also have to love our fellow human beings. That element of love is there. In both love people. for God and for human beings. Give her a round of applause. Okay. Let's move on now. Deuteronomy chapter 8, from which we had our first reading today. Moses tells the people to remember. Now, I have mentioned here, this here before, and I want to repeat it. The word remember is one of the most prominent words in the Old Testament in the scriptures remember in the entire scripture old and new the word remember is one of the most significant in fact in certain perspectives it is the most significant why because when you remember what God has done in your life you live in Thanksgiving you live in gratitude, you try to keep the commandments, you live in obedience, you honor God, and so on. But when you forget what God has done, then you behave anyhow. Moses understood, Joshua understood, that the reason why the children of Israel misbehave is that they do forget. That is why every time the word keeps recurring, remember, remember, Remember that your father was a wandering Aramean in Iran and Iraq. Your father was a wandering Aramean when the Lord called your father and promised him this land flowing with milk and honey. Remember, don't forget. Don't forget that you were nobodies when the Lord called you and gave you this status. The day you forget, then you misbehave. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Your fathers were slaves in Egypt when with a mighty hand God brought them out, crossed the Red Sea, dry shore, and gave them pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. Don't forget. Don't forget how you were hungry in the desert and the Lord provided miraculous meal, manna from heaven. 
how you were thirsty in the rocks of Meribah and he provided water. Don't forget that you would have all died in the desert. Remember that it was a place of wild snakes and scorpions that would have killed you all. But the Lord heard your cry and saved you. Remember. That word remember is very significant for the children of Israel but also for us. Because we are going to be hearing also in the New Testament how the various writers of the letters of the New Testament keep re re referring to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Telling us, don't forget what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for you. Remember. Remember that the Son of God came down and suffered and died a shameful death and rose from the dead for you so that you may have life. Don't forget. Remember. If you forget anything after today's homily, don't forget what? remember don't forget to remember <laughs> Moses tells the people to remember the many benefits granted them by God when they left Egypt and journeyed through the desert of particular note Moses mentioned is what is the miraculous food the manna which neither they nor the ancestors had known but which with which the Lord fed them he said it was to teach them can we read that that man does not live on bread alone but everything that comes from the mouth of God again it was to teach them that good man does not live on bread alone but everything that comes from the mouth of God now he went on Moses went on to say remember do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt slavery who guided you through the desert with scorpions and snakes who brought you water from the rock uh, when you would have died of thirst who fed you with manna when you would have died of hunger then Moses said you see the human being it is as if it is in his nature that when he is getting on very well when he is suffering they remember God that's why they say poor man God they na God they na uh -huh. because when man poor he they remember God God they but when the man don't reach Eh? when he don't get everything he they forget God so Moses said remember when you do settle in the land that the Lord your God has given you do not forget the one who has brought you this far when everything begins to go well for you don't forget how at critical moments of fear God protected you with pillar of fire by night and cloud by day when you have conquered all your enemies and your economy begins to flourish not like Nigerian economy but when your economy begins to flourish don't forget how amidst the life-threatening hunger and thirst in the desert God provided you with manna from heaven and water from the rocks of Meribah those of you who know um, the case of Ireland Ireland was one of the poorest countries in Europe up to the last 30 years many of you know right Ireland was one of the poorest countries in Europe up to the last 30 years. And every, everybody, they go to church. Church full everywhere. Plenty. Father, remember Father, plenty. Sister, plenty. In the last 30, 35 years, with IT, computer, whatever, Ireland has just blossomed in economy. It is a they go to church. It is a they go to church. Empty. What have they done? They have forgotten they did not remember above all Moses says to them and this is significant because it is the theme of today do not forget that material food what the people of Ireland the majority of them have done today is to forget that material food is not sufficient they are making progress in technology making progress in material they have forgotten that material food is not enough don't forget that material food is not sufficient for man does not live on bread alone. When the bread ran out and the water dried off, their survival depended entirely on the word of God that made new life possible for them. Now listen. It is the word of God that makes things possible. It is not bread that saved them. Material bread. It was the word of God. How? Even from the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 we were told that it was all emptiness and void and confusion until God spoke what did he speak let there be light and there was light the Word of God and the power of the Word of God now when they were hungry in the desert and they cried and they complained and so on did they get bread until God spoke 
So their saving grace is not bread, it is the word of God. When there was problem of thirst, no water, and they cried and they were dying, and Moses called to God, the water came when God spoke. So it was the word of God that is the saving grace that gives life. It was the creative word of God which brought them manna, the bread from heaven, and gave them life on daily basis. Now in the Gospel of John, the one that has been referred to, Jesus is presented as the Word of God. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among God. In the beginning, on the read Bible too. In the beginning was the Word was the Word was. I like the thing in German. Dr. Njoku. Imam Fang va das Wort. Das Wort va mit Gott. Das Wort va Gott. Look at clap for me. This word of God revealed himself as the new bread come down from heaven. The bread of heaven is the very life of Christ. It is not a symbol of Christ. It is the very life of Christ. Take note of this because as we are dealing with the Eucharist today, people, some of you, they visit some churches and they will say that they are doing communion. Nobody is empty. Our belief is that we are receiving the very body and blood of Jesus Christ. Spirit and body. Divinity and humanity. Those churches don't believe it like that. That's why there's a big difference. Do you understand? They say they are receiving a symbol. Just like that person says something like symbol. We say we are receiving the body of Christ. That's the big difference. That's the very, and it's a very big difference. It's between light and darkness. Very big difference. To eat the body, the bread Jesus gives is to share in the life of God himself. It is to partake in eternal life. Take note of that. At the Last Supper, Jesus gives himself away. As I indicated at the beginning, like a doctor who has done everything for his students and then gives his body also. Jesus gives himself away as food and drink for his followers. This is my body given for you. This is the cup of my blood that will be shed out for you. Do this in memory of me. Hey. Can you see the word remember coming another way? Can you see? Do this in remembrance of me. Do this so that you may not forget me and what I have done. That is what it means. So every time you hear the priest say, Take this, all of you, and eat. This is my body. Do this in memory of me. What he's saying is, don't forget. Do this in memory of me. In effect, Jesus charges his followers to keep his memory alive. Eat this bread in my name. Drink this cup in my name so that my memory will be kept alive. By gathering together to break this bread and eat in his name, his memory will be kept alive. But take note gathering to eat in his name. If Ambassador Epan and his wife come to church this morning and they not talk to one another for house for the last three days or one week, when they come and eat this, are they eating in his name? Eh? <laughs> I hope you talked in the last three days. <laughs> if people have all kinds of enmity, hatred, resentment, and so on so forth towards one another. If they come and share this bread, are they eating it in his name? No. He says, eat it in my name. And we know what it means to eat in his name. To eat in a manner that is worthy of him. Good. Jesus' command is to the effect that, look, you can do whatever you wish. There are so many things you can choose to do or not do. But whatever else you do, you must keep my memory alive by eating my body and drinking my blood. Can we say this together? Whatever else you do, 
or you don't do you must keep my memory alive by eating my the, my uh, this bread and drinking this cup now this is why from the earliest times from the time of peter and james and john and paul this is why the early church the most significant part of their gathering daily or weekly is what is the breaking of bread go and read acts chapter 2 acts chapter 2 the same uh, chapter where we had pentecost the next day when they began to gather what was the most significant feature in their gathering it was breaking bread this is why also till today the church continues to gather in communities like the church of the assumption we continue to gather in communities every day and every sunday to keep the memory of jesus alive so that we may not forget by breaking bread by celebrating the eucharist and this is the most important thing you can do for christ do this in memory of me every time therefore my friends every eucharistic gathering like this is a powerful statement it is a declaration you see human beings don't do things for nothing our drama the sacred drama that we engage in here is a statement is a declaration what are we declaring and i want you to say that this is what we are declaring or i hope that you agree that this is what we are declaring number one we are declaring that we are privileged beneficiaries of the saving mission of jesus christ we are declaring that we know that we are here it is a privilege that we have salvation promise us that we have the pledge of salvation in christ we know that we are not worthy of it that it is a privilege can we say it together we know that we are privileged beneficiaries of the saving mission of christ two we are overwhelmed at the tremendous love by which the son of god died for us while we were yet sinners saint paul says ah, look oh, even for somebody to die for a friend that is very holy a friend that is very good he had but that what makes god's tremendous love mysterious love like that is that he died for us while we were yet sinners now three we are declaring three we are keeping his memory alive holding it sacred celebrating it anew and in this way receiving new life what we are saying is that we are keeping his memory alive that's why we came today to keep the memory of jesus alive to hold it sacred to say the memory of jesus is very sacred it's not something to play with and that we are celebrating that memory of jesus not only as something that happened 2000 years ago but as something that can give us new life even today that as i am bubbling now that it is the life-giving power of jesus and the body of jesus Chinedu, am i not bubbling are you bubbling more than me oh we are bubbling we are alive by virtue of the life-giving element in his body that he gives to us next number four we dare not forget we refuse to forget the momentous event of his suffering death and resurrection again we dare not forget we refuse to forget the suffering death and resurrection the momentous event of his suffering that aha who has not spoken his language maybe i yeah. Yes. Who has who can say it so smoothly in his language? Uh -huh. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> Can we say it once again together? We dare not forget. Two, we refuse to forget the momentous events of his suffering, death, and resurrection. This is what we are saying when we come to Mass. Each time, we, it's a pity when some people say that you go and attend Mass, say Catholics don't pray. 
what is more prayer than what we celebrate here? What is there is no greater prayer than to offer the Son of God to God and to re, to memorialize his suffering, death, and resurrection. That's the highest prayer. That's why we call it the summit of the church's prayer and the summit of the church's gathering. It is just a pity that, well, if people are doing it by rote memory, if they are doing it by just by habit, of course, nothing happens. It's a pity, and my hope is that our celebration today will open our eyes. Number five, we are not ungrateful people. Can we read it? We are not ungrateful people. So we are daily thanking God for the salvation won for us in the body and blood of Jesus. Again, we are not ungrateful people. So we are daily thanking God for the salvation won for us in the body and blood of Jesus. Number six, we believe that Jesus becomes really and truly present in his divinity every time we break this bread in his name and in his memory. Aha. It's called the real presence. And I want to tell you that if you understand this very well, then you will decide today whether you are a Catholic or an Anglican. Because this is the difference. Every other thing that you see between Catholics and Anglicans is not important. This is the biggest difference. Do you understand that? It is called the real presence. Belief in the real, we Catholics believe in the real presence. That it is Jesus we are receiving because he says so. And that we are not receiving something like Jesus. We are not receiving a symbol of Jesus. That's why people kneel down. And unfortunately some people commit blasphemy when they say we are worshipping idols. They know, no, may God forgive them. Jesus pronounced the fact that when you eat this, it is my body you eat. And so when people come to church, they genuflect. They kneel because they say, it is Jesus I am approaching. And people who are living in ignorance say they are worshipping idols. May God forgive them once again. Number seven. We recognize that the Eucharist is a dangerous memory. Ah. You know that not every memory, not everything that happened before you want to remember. Eh? You know there are some dangerous memories. There are some things that happened in the past that you don't want to remember because if you remember it can generate some new sentiments, isn't it? Okay. The Eucharist is also a dangerous memory. Why? How many of you like to remember death every day? Some people, you can't, they don't want to talk about death, isn't it? But this one is a dangerous memory that the Lord has asked us to remember. It's a dangerous memory because it is a memory of what? Suffering and death. It's a memory of something that many people say is not my portion. A memory of suffering and death. Two, it's a, it's a, it's a memory of what? The memory of sacrificial love, boundless forgiveness, and radical commitment. <laughs> How many people want to remember that? That's why I say it's a dangerous memory. Because you cannot memorialize, you cannot bring back the memory of how the Lord Jesus Christ died for us out of sacrificial love, the length at which we, he went out of love for us. You can't remember that and refuse to love your neighbor if you really remember. Do you get the point? It is a dangerous memory because bringing it to your mind should trigger your doing the same. And it is not an easy task. So it is dangerous. It is a dangerous memory because it calls for boundless forgiveness. And how many people want to forgive, forgive just anything? There are people here who say it is difficult. Ah, we are human beings. This thing is difficult. Because we are not yet ready for boundless forgiveness. But memorializing what Jesus has done on the altar every day challenges us to go into boundless forgiveness. Yes, a radical commitment. Commitment to the Father's will, even when, it even when it means suffering and pain and sometimes death. Here, sometimes and many times I say, oh, people do say, oh, what did man go do? You are faced with some challenge, a little challenge. You want a job and you can't get a job easily unless you bribe, unless you come and sleep with somebody, unless you whatever. And you say, what did man go do? I've waited for three years, no job. What did man go do? Man, if he do something, man, if he die. If you remember 
the radical commitment of Jesus Christ to the truth, the radical commitment of Jesus Christ to the way, to the right thing, ah, that memory will make you refrain from doing what is not acceptable to him. Next, the memory of absolute obedience, unwavering trust, and complete surrender. Many people don't want that memory because they don't want to surrender completely. They don't want to have obedience that is absolute. That's why this memory is a dangerous one. Number eight, as the body of Jesus Christ becomes bread, broken for the salvation of the world, we too accept to become bread broken for our brothers and sisters, especially those who are most in need. Uh -huh. No, I was writing this, presuming that you will agree with me. <laughs> Do you understand? I was, all this number one to nine that I have here, I was writing it presuming. No, I was saying when we are doing it, we are declaring. Now, in this one, I think we have to say it I. As the body of Jesus Christ becomes bread broken for the salvation of the world, I too accept to become bread broken for my brothers and sisters, especially those who are most in need. One more time. As the body of Jesus becomes bread broken for the salvation of the world, I too accept to become bread broken for my brothers and sisters who are Muslims. This is it. Bread broken for the world. And to break bread, they think no easy now. Because to break bread, they, they tear am, Abby. The bread cannot remain whole. You lose something. You suffer some pain. But this is what Jesus did for us. And this is what he wants us to do for our neighbors. Number nine. You're tired of reading. We accept to live by the logic of the kingdom with the Beatitudes as our guide. You remember we did in our faith clinic Beatitudes? Good. Now there's an interpretation here. One, to be poor at heart and in spirit in a world of widespread materialism and inordinate craving for wealth, privilege, and influence. Jesus says in the first beatitude, blessed are the poor for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Good. So we are saying, we accept, or I accept to do what? One, once again, I accept to be poor at heart and in spirit in a world of widespread materialism and inordinate craving for wealth, privilege, and two, Jesus Christ says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. So what do I say? I accept to mourn with those who mourn and to mourn at every instance of sin, injury, wickedness, and iniquity. Now listen. It is not just somebody who died. Somebody lost somebody and they are mourning. You go and join them to mourn. That one is easy now. But to mourn at every instance of sin. Recognizing that Jesus lives in me. And as I eat Jesus, I am Jesus. Any time that I do anything that appears like sin. That is even near sin. If I am really a Christian. If I understand what eating the body is, then I will be in agony. I will mourn. It is a terrible thing for somebody who says he's a Christian to brag about something that is obviously sinful. Isn't it terrible? God forbid that any of you here should commit a sin and brag about it. If you remember one of the poems I have read here, I said, I have seen the light. Because I have seen the light, I can no longer sin gloriously. Having seen the light, if I sin, it should be shamefacedly, not gloriously. Having seen the light of God, if I commit sin, I should mourn. I should be in torture. I also said in that poem, I have known the truth and I can no longer lie gallantly. There are too many Christians going around lying gallantly and sinning gloriously because they don't know what they are doing. May they get to know what they are doing. 
any of us who commit sin and notice that we commit sin may the lord put that grace in us to mourn and after mourning to be able to run away from sin the next time also it is not only sin in ourselves when we see sin in our environment when we see sin in our husband sin in our wife sin in our neighbor sin in, uh, in our community sin in our, at our place of work may we mourn the sin seriously and do whatever we can do so that that sin does not repeat itself i want an amen to that amen. then injury that somebody is suffering injury may we have the grace of christian compassion to mourn the injury of the person the injury in society the injury to children weak acts of wickedness there's so much wickedness going around may we not take it as just any one of those things you know i i have complained here before about people who sit down and watch all kinds of stupid things on television including a lot of violence things things that we should just see and like ha this is terrible people are sitting and crossing their legs and eating popcorn and enjoying it ah ah evil is evil whether it is on television or in real life what did i say evil is evil no christian should enjoy the sight of evil my dear friends somebody sits down to watch people committing fornication do you know what you are doing you are aiding and abetting in the sin every act of sin should make a, a christian recoil and mourn and mourn so it is not only sin in yourself but sin in others you see the people of this age our people have become t t ch ch we have become enterprising in sin so enterprising in sin that somebody is in hollywood committing sodomy committing fornication and somebody is in abuja and is enjoying it watching television and enjoying it it's terrible and that is new it's a new reality in the history of sin in the world before we did not have the capacity to be in abuja and watch somebody committing sin in las vegas today there is that capacity thanks to television and internet but what we need to do is to use our sense of judgment do you understand to use our sense of judgment so that we will not be part of the sin being committed in atlantic city they are committing sin and they are so terrible in sin that they bring camera to cover their sin and they bring it to idiot you to watch and you are watching it and you are watching it like somebody who gets sense may the lord open our eyes open our minds to see the danger of media evil evil that comes through the media and my people are just consuming and consuming this evil through the media like people we know get sense may we get sense i want a louder amen, amen. okay number three we are the, jesus christ says blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness so what is our commitment we accept can we read to hunger and thirst for justice and fair play in a world of widespread injustice oppression inequality abuse and neglect of the poor number four jesus christ says blessed are the meek and the humble for they shall inherit the earth what is our promise we accept to be meek to be humble to be gentle in a world of pride and arrogance power and domination number five jesus christ says blessed are the merciful for they shall be shown mercy what is our commitment we accept to be merciful to be forgiving kind and compassionate in a world of wickedness and vengeance number six jesus christ says blessed are the pure of heart for they shall see god so what do we accept to do we accept to be pure in heart in a world of rampant corruption immorality immodesty infidelity and unjustity now number seven jesus christ says blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called children of god so what do we say we accept to be peacemakers in a world of relentless strife hatred and malice and violence and finally jesus christ says blessed are you when men persecute you when they abuse you when they speak all kinds of calumny against you on my account what do we say to jesus we accept to endure persecution 
for righteousness sake in a world where evil men and women are often in control now Helen and uh, my young man there the levels levels of the body of Christ four levels of the body of Christ one is the physical one you see the person walking there he was walking on the streets of Nazareth and Judea that's physical Jesus that gathered 12 apostles that's one level that body one level it is that body that when he died Joseph of Arimathea went to beg right he went to beg Pilate to give him the body to bury that is the physical body like my own like your own it is that same body that the women went on the third day the women went to anoint the body in the tomb it is that body that's the first level that guy where they walk up there now the second body the one that is coming out of a hole the resurrected or changed body of Christ you know it's not the same body I hope you know at Easter we celebrated that it is not the same body the body that resurrected it be like the first one but it's not like it's not the same the resurrected body of Christ the one that passed through closed doors you remember I passed through closed doors and the one that ascended to heaven at on ascension day is a different kind of body so that's that one then the third body is the mystical body of Christ which is you and I can you all join your hands together as you're sitting down just join your hands as body of Christ join your hands as body of Christ as you sit down and join your hands we are what the body of Christ can we say it together we are the body of Christ thank you finally the next body of Christ is what we're about to celebrate the Eucharist the blessed sacrament the body of Christ given to the disciples to eat at the Last Supper referred to in today's gospel as the bread of life or bread that has come down from heaven does everybody understand the four classifications good communion with the Lord and communion with one another the Eucharist is called communion because can we read that together as we eat the body of Christ we become one with him a bond of intimacy is established with God there is no other means that can bring about the kind of intimacy that we can have with God by virtue of the Eucharist you can be close to somebody when you de talk with him on the phone right you can be close to somebody when you go to visit him you can be close to somebody when but when you eat the person you are one that intimacy is superlative it's more than any kind of intimacy so communion really means actual communion we are one with the Lord next is communion because all of us who share the one body of Christ invariably become what one body with one another that's why I ask you to join your hands there is a bond of intimacy that should have been established between us among one another Jew and Gentile Igbo and Hausa Ishekiri and Urobo TV and Jukun we form one body in Christ now this idea has serious implications if this is true and we know it's true because Jesus says it and St. Paul says it and it is very clearly said then what are the implications it has implications for what our unity our unity now my friends this is where the problem is where the problem is that every other thing perhaps that I have said is easy to understand and to begin to try to practice but this one with all the ethnic prejudices tribal cleavages all the cliques and whatever we make a nonsense of the concept of the body of Christ everywhere including in the church including in this church cliques I am for father judge I am not a father judge I say if you are not for father judge get out of here because father judge is the one to coordinate the body of Christ here if you are not for father judge what did I say get out of here there cannot be two bodies in this church there is only one body of Christ 
there should be no clicks there should be no clicks if you are not for father george why father george is parish priest if you are not for father george get out of here you are you are agent of satan it's true the implication for unity is very serious body of christ is one body and anyone who attempts to divide that body i say is an agent of satan It has implications for our sense of family, our sense of community. How do we feel we are one family? It has serious implications for how we care for one another. If we are one body, if the if the toe, if the, the toe get weak low, Dr. Njoko, and you say this one not be my business. Eh? If the toe get weak, low, you say it's not your business, then uh -huh, something is wrong with the person. How we care for one another. It has serious implications. Finally, my friends, I decided to deal with this in detail because, you see, we had done halfway on the Eucharist in our faith clinic. If you remember, Dr. Tao, we had done halfway in the clinic. And when I decided that we are working on this, I decided that, okay, we'll finish it today so that we don't need to do the part two of that. So I decided to do this implication, the, 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 the Eucharistic devotion and reverence to the Eucharist. What does it mean? The first part of Eucharistic devotion is that we get to love the gift of Christ's body and blood. We get to love. I mean, that we think of the fact that you mean the Son of God. You mean the Son of God actually died for me and gave me his body to eat? Hey, I don't understand, but, but this, is, this is mysterious. This is awesome. This is preposterous. And then I live my life every day in thanksgiving for what God has done for me like that. Every day. Thank you, Lord, for your body. Thank you, Lord, for your blood. Thank you, Lord, for the breaking of bread. So now I see you clearly. Now I understand. Now I see you clearly. Now I understand. Thank you, Lord, for your body. Thank you, Lord, for your blood. Thank you, Lord, for the breaking of bread. Oh, now I see you clearly. Now I understand. Now I see you clearly. Now I understand. Thank you, Lord, for your body. Thank you, Lord, for your blood. Thank you, Lord, for the breaking of bread. So now I see you clearly. Now I understand. Jesus, now I see you clearly. Now I understand. Every day, a Christian, a Catholic who partakes in the body of Christ should live consciously and subconsciously in thanksgiving for the gift of the body of Christ. Next is reverent reception. Reception of the body of Christ with what? With reverence. Now, for this church, me, I don't see different kind of things. Person go to chop chewing gum, gum like this. Uh, body of Christ, amen. Is that a reverent reception? When I know say we're supposed to fast one hour before you carry it. Eh? Some people come chop your carries, you go see plenty of cola where they mount. We never finish chopping. And in this church, I must I'm being frank, in this church, much more than many churches that I have been, people come in any time of mass and come and receive communion i have been here you know in the middle of the week we put the altar here 
I am here saying mass. I we are at the our father. Our father don't nearly finish. Somebody coming through the door like this. As he come, he no go sit. He just comes straight to receive communion. What does the church say is the time you enter church by which you become late to receive the Eucharist? What time? After the opening prayer. Meaning when we finish Gloria. When we finish Gloria and we say the opening prayer, if you come after that, you are late. You are not supposed to receive communion. Do you know that? People are entering church anytime, anytime, and are receiving communion anytime. When they are coming, they are greeting, they are chatting with their friend. When they just reach here, then, then they take the hand off and then they receive communion. Hi! Now, those of you who are habitual latecomers, who come late every time, know this today. If you come after the opening prayer is over, you are not to receive communion. I urge you to try to be active participants in the celebration of the Eucharist. And to be active participant means that you get to church five minutes before time and say your prayers and prepare. They're supposed, for such a serious sacrifice, there's supposed to be a period of preparation now. Not so. I came in here this morning at quarter to seven. The children of Divine Mercy Secondary School were here at quarter to seven. They were here. What to seven, ten minutes to seven. So I was chatting with them and said, Have you prayed? And they said yes. And I was asking them what they prayed for. They came here 45 uh, 40 minutes before the mass. So they had time to pray and prepare. Those of you who come late every Sunday, can you hear me? There are people here. And I know I have been screaming about this for more than a year. There are people here who make it a point of duty to enter church after this homily. Others come during gospel. The readings were going on today and church wardens, if you don't take this matter seriously, I'll sack you. The readings were going on and people kept entering, especially upstairs. Church wardens, if you don't take this matter seriously, I take what I am doing seriously. There were people that time we were insisting on people coming early. There are people who went around saying that Father George is driving people from the church because he says that uh, if the mass has started, he will close the door. Of course, I will close the door. Go to where you can go to mass during our Father and receive communion, not in Church of the Assumption Asukuru, and not while I'm here. This is serious. I am serious with what I am doing. I devoted my life to do this and to show you the way. And if you are not prepared, then you are the one to give way. I, I, I take what I'm doing seriously. That's why I give my life to it. And if you come here, I want you to take it seriously. Come to Mass five minutes before time. Say your prayers. Then you will get the benefit of the Eucharist. You know what? I said this to you before. My business here is to make sure that me and all of you go to heaven. That's why I'm here. I have no other business I have no other business that's my business to make sure that I go to heaven and that I don't go to heaven alone that I hold hand of all of you that's why I am here that's why I'm shouting like this oh may the Lord hear our prayer Amen. number two I have mentioned it adequate preparation for meaning preparation what is preparation for the Eucharist you avoid sin and if you go do foolishness, go commit sin, you go to confession. And then you prepare for the Eucharist. Come early, pray, spend some time, you know, to pray and so on. And participate completely from beginning to the end. And what did I say is the beginning? Before the opening prayer. Aha. Whether it is weekday or daily mass. Number three. Faithful participation at benediction. We have benediction in this church. Thanks to Dr. Sorry, the ambassador uh, Epang and a few people. Otherwise, the Reverend Father will be doing benediction for himself here. Sunday evening, 5.30, there is benediction every Sunday. Or most Sundays, unless there's an event and there's no evening mass. Whenever there's evening mass in this parish, there's benediction also. Please, it is for everybody. It is an occasion for us to adore 
the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament and thank him. You know, when we sing Tantumego, when we sing O Salutaris, these are songs of thanksgiving for the Lord who has given himself to us in the Eucharist. Then, you know, I beg, I remember, during benediction, during benediction, I think Ambassador Ipa is able to bear me witness, the children, your children that you bring for catechism at 3 o'clock, they know they allow us to do benediction. No? Do you understand? Some of you bring your children for catechism at 3 o'clock. I thank you. But at 4 or 4.30, please come and take the children. You know what happens? The parents don't come on time and the children are running all over this whole place. This place is like a theater, a stadium. They run from here to that place. They go to the band and beat the band. They don't. And then there's blessings are coming here. The priest is kneeling now here. One day during benediction, I had to, I was distracted. I had to get up and call and the mother of the person was sitting down out there and the child was all over the place i know that a month ago my new assistant father vincent told me he was here with the blessed sacrament kneeling down here you know what he saw it's all of a sudden he saw shadow of human being behind this mosaic some of those children had found their way to the top of that place I have been here for three years. I don't know say they fit rich there. <laughs> so Father Vincent said he was kneeling down here, and somehow when he looked up, he saw shadow of human being. I don't know how he did it. Whether he abandoned the blessed comment, <laughs> but he said he 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 went and discovered that children, children of this church, were surveying that place. And he said he was frightened, but because if they fell from there. Now death die. Please help take care of your children. Silence, decorum, comportment, modesty, every in every place where the body of Christ is exposed. Now some people don't even know. When you see this kind, this kind thing we stand there, then they call them monstrance. When you see it standing in front of the church here, it means the body of Christ is exposed for adoration. From the beginning of the door, when you kill it, you kneel down. We don't accept that you should walk right straight. We are saying mass, and it is time for consecration. Oh, the height of this. Some people continue to walk straight in front towards the altar. Ah, that's not good. My prayer is that we will get to understand this great gift of God and treat it with all reverence. Scripture passages. Children of Israel were fed with manna from heaven. Go and read the whole passage. Exodus chapter 16. Then Jesus' banquet of life, the Beatitudes that we have just discussed. Then these are passages about the Eucharist, the establishment of the Eucharist. Acts of Apostles chapter 2 verse 42 the early church celebrated the Eucharist and shared what they owned in common. Paul warns against eating the body of Christ unworthily in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Heavenly Father we thank you. We praise you. We glorify your holy name for your many blessings. Thank you for your love and goodness. Lord we do not know how to thank you for the enormity of the gift of the body and blood of Christ. We are overwhelmed when we think of your son Jesus giving us his body and his blood. May your name be praised forever. Lord, give us the right disposition. Give us the reverence. Give us the sense of silent admiration and adoration at the presence of the body of Christ. Lord, particularly as our intention is at this Mass, we pray for those who do not receive the cup of the Eucharist. Whatever is the obstacle on the way, Lord Jesus, remove them. Lord, those who on account of sin are not able to approach the altar, Lord, remove sin from their lives. Those who have entangled themselves with all kinds of things, maybe marital problems, Lord, solve those problems for them that we may be able to be part of the body of Christ and be truly one in the body of Christ to the glory of your name. Through Christ our Lord.